How's it going? Hi. Mm -hmm. How are How you? Is... Good. Thanks so much for joining me. Of course, a pleasure. Thanks for okay. having me. Of course. So just a quick introduction, Dr. Christine Shaver. So you're a dermatologist, board certified dermatologist, and a hair transplant specialist yes. here in New York City. Yes, correct. <laughs> so, perfect. And then I saw that you spent some time in Philadelphia for some of your training. Yeah, my residency for dermatology was in Philadelphia. Cool. Yeah, I was at Temple for ENT Head and Neck. Yeah, oh, Center, awesome. Center City was a nice area. Actually, probably my second favorite city after New York. Yeah, yeah. Philly is great. I remember playing volleyball on the, the courts there at Drexel. I used to uh, be a member of the boathouses along the river there. Yeah. I'd go yeah. out in a, in a shell and row on the weekends. <laughs> it was really oh, it's relaxing. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. We would just go on short little runs along the water there. So, yeah, good, yeah. good times. So, fun memories. Well, this is great. So, yeah, I mean, we haven't met yet in person, but this is one way to do it, I guess, you know, during these crazy times. Social distancing. <laughs> right. But this is one, one way to, to meet, right, these days? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, have you guys started back up yet or what's what's the plan for your office? So surgery has not started back up yet. You know, at this point, you know, we're an elective cosmetic procedure. So we're holding off at this point until we're given more clearance to resume. Also, you know, it's really tricky in hair transplant because it takes a whole team to get the actual procedure done along beside me. So a lot of my staff, they're in New Jersey or Long Island and they're quarantined and they have children at home now who are not in school. So, you know, the whole team is kind of stuck based off of the regulations right now in New York and the surrounding areas. So, you know, I'm available right now for urgent stuff and I am going to the office for particular more urgent cases, but Otherwise, cosmetic surgery, of course, everybody wants to have it done right now because everyone's at home hiding out. So it's yeah. the perfect time to be healing from a cosmetic procedure. But until we're given the clearance, you know, we're going to hold off probably till June. Yeah, no, it makes sense. Same here. Yeah. I've spoken to some of the techs that, you know, usually work with. And it's kind of amazing to me that there are people, at least on Long Island, apparently, I'm told. I haven't been given names, which is fine, who are operating now. And it's really it's kind of concerning yeah I don't think there's a green light for Long Island and so you know I think not everyone's gonna follow the rules and that's just uh, people have to make a personal decision and then I've had patients call in this week even who like have wanted a procedure like now and yes. like, no that's not an option right and, you know they said oh yeah okay fine others are open so we'll just go there so you know it's just what it is I mean first of all Long Island I think as what I've heard is bigger exposure rates than New York City so that's very yeah. concerning and then beyond that I think you know, as a physician hood, you know, we should be supporting each other and making kind of similar decisions on when it's safe to restart and not trying to obtain advantages by opening your office earlier than others, because, right. you know, patients should have the freedom to go where they please for their surgeries and not just be funneled into one office because that's the only one opening up early in the time of a virus infection. So that's unfortunate. Listen, to hear. I, I agree with you 100 percent, but yeah. some of our colleagues do not. <laughs> Yikes. So how do you envision like I guess the experience for the patient changing and specifically hair transplant just like you know kind of once we do open since the our procedures are long and we have a bunch of people in the room right uh, there's the obvious of just masks and gloves all the time but anything else special that you guys are doing or just how do you think it'll be different for people yeah dr bernstein and i have been planning for a lot of these things over the past couple of weeks and we've also been meeting with our colleagues in the ishrs the international mm -hmm. society of hair restoration surgery we've all been kind of bouncing our ideas off of each other because you know beyond the standard protocols masks gloves fever checks i think all doctors offices are doing that specifically for hair transplant there are additional concerns i think we're probably going to be having our staff spaced out throughout the office while they're doing graft dissection and graft uh, sorting the micro scopes will not be as they standardly are right next to each other. We're also installing advanced ventilation systems in the office so that clears the air really rapidly of any types of viral particles. We're also putting off a lot of beard transplants because working that close to the face, it's really hard to put a mask on a patient when you're working in their beard area. So certain facial procedures we have to put off for now. Yeah, we're also having our patients COVID testing before they come in. So we're requiring people have antibody testing and swab testing within five days of their surgery. You know, that being said, that only provides you a little bit of extra knowledge 
knowledge, but you really still have to treat everybody as if they're potentially infected. Smaller things that we think about in hair transplant are like the fact that you're spraying down the scalp in between a lot of the procedural aspects that you're doing. So, you know, less aggressive spraying measures just to minimize aerosol and masks that cover your eyes and your mouth and most of your face. It's just small things that are going to prevent exposures. And of course, you know, every day we have to very carefully sterilize the office and check all the staff for any signs or symptoms. Yeah. Are you doing any specific uh, staff testing? Because actually a patient asked me that. Yeah. And I asked around and it seems like a lot of people are just doing like a one-time antibody test with, when they return to work, which um, I don't think that that's totally effective or useful, but it's also like if that's what everyone is doing, then, you know, why stand out? Uh, do you guys have any other special requirements? Yeah. Staff. We do have a daily check-in with mm -hmm. fever, you know, symptom, they have to deny symptoms of all the various, you know, COVID symptomology. You know, we do have the antibody testing that we're going to have available, but I think that only really does tell you so much. I mean, you just yeah. have to take standard precautions, follow all the CDC guidelines. So you just have to think that everybody is a potential exposure and just be really, really careful. Right. But you're not doing like viral testing on staff, right? Well, we're doing antibody testing on staff. But not for PCR? Not PCR, just IgM, IgG. They can get a swab. And even, you know, among the antibody testing, it's very unclear which ones are very good quality. Yeah, uh, totally. A lot of people are getting false negatives, so. Yeah, it's kind of scary. Same with the swabs. I'm actually doing saliva testing for the, um, you know, for the actual test for patients. Yeah. Uh, it's a really high sensitivity and specificity, but it's like a, you know, it's a send out to Texas. So takes yeah. a couple of days. None of it is, is straightforward and, uh, and easy. Right. Cool. So just to dive into hair transplants, what would you say are the biggest misconceptions that people have? Because I feel like I always feel very similar questions from patients. Are there some that you guys get like pretty commonly where you're like, no, like that's not at all how it works or anything like that? Biggest misconceptions? Yeah, I think there's endless misconceptions in the field of hair and hair transplant. I would say the biggest thing that I, I always see every day is that people think hair transplant surgery is a quick fix. That, you know, it's just as simple as coming in, you move around some hair, whatever you've got when you come in, you walk out full head, you know, you look Brad Pitt-esque. But, you know, in, in, in reality, you know, it's really a two part process. In my opinion, I spend a, a large portion of my consultations talking about the importance of medicine, which is something I think a lot of surgeons touch on, but a lot also overlook because, you know, medication, you know, such as finasteride for men, it prevents a lot of long term thinning. And without it, a lot of people are likely to continue to lose hair over the next 30 to 50 years of their life. Yeah. And they're pretty much guaranteed to be signing up for future thinning and potentially want a second surgery. So, you know, in my opinion, when I want to have, you know, happiest patients possible and the fullest possible head of hair, yeah. I want them to preserve what they already have and just take a daily pill. And then I can correct what problems are already present. And overall, then they should be pretty happy long term. But I think a lot of people, they want to skip medicine. Nobody really wants to take a daily pill, which I understand. But, you know, not signing up for a lifetime catch up game of surgery after surgery after surgery is, in my idea, you know, a good thing. So gotcha. No, that, that's a great point. And someone asked if finasteride is uh, preventative. And I think that's exactly what it's being used for, if you if you would agree. Yeah, certainly. I mean, most men continue to thin over the course of their life. It doesn't necessarily stop after a certain age. And a lot of people, you can kind of figure out if they're going to continue to thin based off their family history, mm -hmm. how many hairs have already currently thinned on examination. And the whole point of finasteride is after a year of taking it, you potentially regrow a little hair and then stabilize dramatically over the course of your life. And there are risks that, you know, we have to discuss with everyone. There's a 2% chance of sexual dysfunction, but in most men, they take it and they are just fine. And it actually does a great job for keeping their hair. Gotcha. Yeah. And then what other types of preventative therapies are you guys usually recommending for men and women? who are just, you know, thinning right. or you're doing a procedure and you're trying to prevent further loss or they come in and it's just too early for surgery. Yeah. So, you know, aside from finasteride, which is approved in men from age 18 and above, there's also minoxidil, which the brand name people are familiar with is Rogaine. It comes in a variety of strengths and a variety of vehicles, but, you know, the strongest one is the 5% men's solution. So I often recommend that one, even often in my 
female patients, I just educate them that it could be too strong for their scalp. But uh, aside from Rogaine or Minoxidil, there's also platelet-rich plasma, which is a very popular item right now. It doesn't work in everybody, unfortunately, but it is a rather homeopathic option in that we draw your blood, we process out the platelets, and those platelets have lots and lots of granules with growth factor in them. And then you can inject all of that into the regions of thinning and help prevent a lot of future hair loss too. But not nearly as strong as finasteride, probably on a similar scale to topical Rogaine in terms of its strength and effect and benefit. What frequency are you recommending that people get the PRP with? The system that I've chosen for our office, which is the Excel system for PRP, often this is similar in a lot of offices, but there's a series of induction sessions. For us, we have three sessions where you come to our office spaced six weeks apart. And after those three initial sessions are complete, we give your hair three additional months to respond to the induction sessions. And then we check at the six month mark after starting to see if you're receiving any benefit. Mm -hmm. And if you are, you then enter maintenance phase, which is one session at our office every six months. There are people, you know, of course, hair loss is kind of a bell curve of, you know, responses. So some people maybe don't have to come in every six months, others come in more frequently, but in general, yeah. the recommendation is once every six months, once you're in maintenance. Of the people who come for a hair transplant, specifically, you know, wanting surgery, what, what type of person would you say you turn away the most most often, like a certain demographic or, uh, you know, who basically who's not a good candidate. Yeah. So the people most, who actually come in. I would say the most frequent person I'm turning away is a male who is too young and has not tried medicine yet. I think it's really tough when you're 21, 22, and you have a lot of genetic thinning in your family and you kind of see the future looking at you know your father or your grandparents and you notice early thinning it's just not appropriate to be transplanting young men who have not tried medicine at all or you know have waited at least a little bit longer to see if they can control their thinning because you're going to end up trapping them in the scenario where you try to please their current issue with their hair thinning and their hairline and they haven't controlled their hair loss and they're going to end up in a lifetime situation where they keep trying to control their loss as they as they can't keep up with it with surgery so that's probably the most common there's a lot of body dysmorphia that's tied up in early hairline thinning too and it's really important not to aggressively transplant a hairline when somebody may thin in other locations on their scalp afterwards when they're older. And then I'd say another really common scenario is unfortunately, a lot of women are not very good candidates for transplant. People who thin diffusely over their scalp, you know, that can happen in both men and women, but a lot of women tend to thin more diffusely. And so if you're gathering grafts that are supposed to be permanent from the back and sides of your scalp, and they're subject to future thinning, it doesn't matter if you gather them and put them in the front or leave them where they are. If they're going to thin, they're going to thin regardless. So you have to really carefully examine people and make sure that they have a stable donor zone that you can harvest good, solid hair that's gonna stay permanent forever. That's another scenario where I often find myself kind of discussing the risks associated and maybe have to turn people away. Right, no, uh, excellent points, especially with the young men. Do you find that too? Very common. Yeah, yeah, I mean, because you know they, they freak out, they worry, uh, which is understandable. But yeah, you just have to basically just explain, just really educate them and explain that you can't possibly just continue to chase that and uh, maybe they need to come back at a later time. So I think it, it makes a, a lot of sense. I agree with that. On to hair techs. There's been a lot of controversy in our field over who yeah. can perform, I guess, portions of procedures because most offices will have the doctor doing some part of the transplant, I hope. But, you know, it, all too often you hear about techs doing 90% you know, plus of the whole procedure, especially if it's um, FUE. So I guess what is your stance on, on that and uh, how do you see this playing out in the future? Because th there have been a couple of lawsuits uh, that have played out, especially in our state, like upstate and people losing you know, their licenses and all types of stuff. And that's probably going to become you know, even more of a problem as, as we move forward. So I guess where do you see all that going? Should doctors get you know, more training than they already have maybe in hair or 
What are your thoughts? Well, one of the really important things is just to be educated on hair in the first place. I mean, having a background and understanding hair is super essential and not to be underestimated. But regarding the hair technicians, it's very clear what the Society of Hair Restoration Surgery says regarding hair technicians. You know, all surgical aspects of the procedure need to be performed by a physician. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in my office, I don't really even call them hair techs because a hair tech to me has almost like a transient floating in, floating out of the office kind of <laughs> mentality to it. All my staff are full time. They've all been trained rigorously under myself or Dr. Bernstein. My oldest technician has worked with me for 25 years years at, at the Bernstein Medical Office. So, you know, we have full-time people who I know their skills. They're not day techs who come in. A lot of offices have day technicians where they hire a service, they get a day technician, that day technician helps with harvesting and implantation and all these things, and you don't know their quality or their skills, and you're relying on them for the results of the procedure that has your name on it. So I have to know that my technicians can do quality graft implantation, quality graft checking and sorting. You know, I do all operation of the artist robot, which is the FUE harvesting we do in our office, and I do all of the surgical aspects of the FUT strip type of procedure. But otherwise, you know, a lot of offices have to rely on assistants who are checking graphs and implanting graphs. And so, you know, it's only to the surgeon's advantage to know your staff and know their skills and train them yourself. So you know that they're of quality ability. Great point. Um, I think people forget that FUE is still surgery, that, you know, even though it's not a strip that you're using a knife or scalpel or something to cut out the strip, you're still using an, a surgical instrument and going, you know, deep under the skin to get the hair. So, you know, I think any kind of text, whether they're full-time or part-time, in my opinion, if they don't have the right degree, which I think officially from the, not just you know, ISHRS, but from their official organizations, I think NPs and PAs, if they're, you know, under proper supervision, are allowed to do that type of work, like the actual mm -hmm. harvesting, but not like, you know, MAs and people with uh, sort of lesser degrees, if you will. Right. Nurses are not allowed to do it. The, the nurse right. organizations don't allow it. Yeah. So um, there's just, I think there's a lot of, I don't know if it's confusion or just the, maybe a, a little bit of abuse of, of that of that system. I mean, I think it actually is on the abuse side because it's very clear what the society regulates as what's considered black market in, in terms of hair. Physicians, unfortunately, don't have enough monitoring in terms of who's in there doing the procedures. And, no. you know, it's really risky. I mean, I just... I think ethically, a doctor takes an oath in medical school to follow the rules and do best by your patients. If you're allowing that type of black market activity to occur in your office, you know, it's really unfortunate. Right. No, I agree. I think beyond just learning the skills, it's hard to build up speed. So now that we've switched mostly to FUE in, in a lot of cases for many different transplant procedures, it takes time to build up the speed and efficiency. And that's something that a lot of people who don't have like a high volume practice, I mean, I do a lot of other facial plastics work. So obviously I'm not as high volume for hair as you guys are, but I mean, I trained, you know, I was with uh, Jeff Epstein for almost two years and, mm -hmm. you know, I had a chance to really kind of get my skills up. But that being said, you know, some of his techs were just faster at, than me at harvesting. Right. So what about someone who doesn't have really that extensive of, of hair training? And then like they have one case every few months or whatever, they can't possibly get to the, the speed that you need to right. do a full case. So I think that's one of the problems with now, you know, most things being done, FUE and patients sort of seeking it out for good reason. That's one of the biggest challenges. And you have techs who go either they're at one office or go between offices, but they're doing it all the time. It's hard to compete with them. And, and then, you know, you hope they're doing good work. But like you said, you can't really tell unless you really know how to do it yourself and then can potentially delegate some of the of the role. So, yeah, it's, it's a complicated thing. It's not... Yeah. I, not as easy as just saying like, oh yeah, like the doctor should do it. It's like really hard to- It's to really tricky. Yeah. And I think, you know, we have an advantage there in, in some respect because we are a full-time hair restoration office. So we live and breathe this every single day. Our technicians are so well-trained and supervised and, you know, they're doing what they're allowed to do and only that. So I think it would be much harder if you had an office that was doing a lot of different types of surgery every day, but we literally just live and breathe hair transplant every single day. So we've kind of streamlined our efficiency in that sense. Right. So someone asked about the advantages and disadvantage of strip versus FUE, if you want to elaborate on that. Yeah, of course. FUT, which has been around for longer, it's the standard strip procedure where, you know, strip of skin is taken from the back and sides of your scalp. It's removed and then 
you know, either sewn up or stapled up. In our offices, we, we actually staple. But the advantage of FUT and often actually a better procedure for a, a lot of people, even though a lot of people come in requesting FUE. So FUT has a great advantage in that you get lots and lots of high numbers of graphs, very, very high, high quality graphs, because that strip that's removed is then dissected underneath the microscopes by the staff. And so every single graph that's removed from that strip is perfect quality, near perfect quality. And so you get high numbers of graphs, very high quality, and that will often lead to much greater coverage than an FUE procedure. So FUE, a lot of people come in requesting that, especially at our office because ours is robotic and it sounds like very advanced technology. A lot of people like that in the days of AI right now. So FUE is a great procedure. I don't fault it at all, but FUE cannot really compete with FUT sometimes in terms of the coverage you can obtain because the graph numbers are slightly lower. The graph quality is slightly lower. Nothing can really beat a hand dissection under a microscope when you're harvesting one by one from outside the scalp. But FUE has the advantage of no line scar. There are still scars. There are scars with every single type of surgical you know, hair transplant procedure. So the difference is just that the scar are they're composed of tiny little dots. Every single graft that you remove all over the back of the scalp forms a small dot. So essentially you're thinning the density at the donor zone, but it allows patients who really prioritize the option to have short hair to keep their hair very short. So for people who are in the military, you know, that might be a, a favored procedure for people who have a tight scalp and can't do an FUT strip procedure where you remove a strip of skin, they would have to do an FUE if they want to do surgery and just people who want short hair and don't want the idea of a line back there. That's a perfectly acceptable reason. But for people who are super bald and want great coverage, often FUT is a better choice because you're going to get the high quality, high numbers of graphs that you'll need. Yeah, that's a great answer. What about in terms of recovery from FUT versus FUE? Do you find that there is a difference in sort of ease of recovery? Yeah, somewhat. You know, for both procedures, you end up with the same product. Ultimately, you end up with individual graphs, which are composed of either one, two, three or four hair follicular units. And all those little follicular units and graphs are placed in the top of your head. Regardless of the FUT or FUE procedures, it still takes 10 days for all of those graphs to seal into the scalp and become permanent. So for the first 10 days, you're looking a little funky. It's red and there's little crusts that form and that's kind of inevitable as you're trying to keep it clean while you're healing. But it's not until day 10 when everything is sealed and permanent and can't be dislodged that you can then scrub off all the crust up there and the redness is largely faded and you can go back to work and feel pretty confident people aren't going to notice you had something done. You know, 10 days really of healing is required for either type of surgery. You can wear a loose cap and try to hide it a little bit. A lot of people like to take off 10 days. I would say that FUE is a little faster in terms of recovery at the back, the donor zone, those little tiny dots where you take out the grafts, they seal up super fast. The donor zone in an FUT, you know, strip procedure where you have a line scar with some staples, that can be a little limiting for highly, highly active individuals. You just can't do major neck stretching, you know, crunches, things that would exaggerate the scar back there just because you want the nicest possible scar. Yeah, makes sense. Good. On to different devices that are used for FUE. You know, people come in and they're sometimes requesting a specific device. They should be just picking a surgeon, you know, based on I guess their prior results and what they're most comfortable using. But regardless, what do you think are sort of the, I guess, biggest differences between like the smart graph, neograph, the robot, and then, I mean, I use the, the Trevolini system, but I'll just let you kind of take it and then I can add stuff about, I guess, the system that I like. Yeah, you know, I, I think the Trevolini of the, like the, of the, you know, manual punches, I think is very popular. We don't do any of the manual FUE harvesting. All of our FUE procedures are solely done robotically with the Artist system. We do the Artist IX, which is the latest top of the line system. Advantage of the Artist is really that you can do it physician operated and it's solely physician operated. It's really fast, even harvest, and the accuracy um, is very good. The interface of the system to choose the follicles is high level. You know, there's artificial intelligence that allows you to choose optimal graphs, limit the graph transaction. Graph quality is very high. However, you know, Artis isn't great in all respects because it's only approved for use on the scalp. You know, some people do body hair transplant and harvest from 
you know, other locations, chest, back, legs, all sorts of places. And you can't do that with the artist robot at this point. The manual punches, you know, unfortunately, I find a lot of offices are having technicians manually punch out a lot of graphs. And so you're kind of subject to whatever technicians on your case that day. In my opinion, if I were a patient, I wouldn't want to put it up to chance of who's harvesting out and making all these tiny little dot scars all over my body. I would much rather know that my surgeon is operating the artist robot and harvesting evenly. You know, we don't use um, any manual punches at this point. That's a great point. Yeah, I mean, in my practice, I, mean, I do most of the harvesting myself. It is very tedious and uh, I like the Trevellini because of the vibrational sort of uh, oscillation aspect of it. It's more gentle on the follicle, you know, than like a sharp punch. And that's one of my criticisms of the Neograft and the SmartGraft systems. And those usually are coming with the technicians and that gets back into the problem that we discussed earlier, where the tech is really doing most of the work. Great, yeah, I really don't have much experience with the artists. I just haven't had a chance to even really see it live. I've definitely you know, heard interesting, good things about it, and it's uh, constantly getting upgraded. So yeah, we'll see. Isn't it also allowing you to do recipient sites now? You can do recipient sites. However, you know, we just find that being an office who's constantly doing our own site making and implantation, we're just better manually doing it than the robot. So we don't okay. actually use that feature. Our staff is just um, so adept at manually implanting graphs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the site making, you know, I do all myself anyway, because I want control over the aesthetics of the procedure. So it is an option. And I think a lot of people who buy the robot buy it so that it has that all in one functionality and they can just right set it and forget it kind of thing, but we want perfect results and as close to perfect as we can get. And sometimes using the robotic functionality is not as good as what you can do manually. We just don't use that function in our office. We do use it for harvesting, but not for implantation. Got it. Do you guys use mostly needles or blades? For site making? For site making, yeah. Yeah, for site making, we use needles, different okay. sizes, of course, for different graphs. Great. And then in terms of like touch-up procedures, do you talk to patients about that in advance? that there might be an area that doesn't grow in as well, or over time, you might want to touch up. What kind of discussion do you have before surgery? And how often do you find yourself kind of doing the actual touch up after like, after you wait a year or whatever you wait? Some of the whole aspect of touch up procedures depends on whether somebody's willing to take medication or not. Certainly, if they're not going to take medicine, they're probably going to come back in in five to 10 years, want more surgery done as they keep thinning. I always mention the likelihood for two procedures in certain cases. Often when somebody wants their hairline finished, you can only make a hairline so dense on a first procedure. And this happens in a lot of my women and my trans patients. You know, for trans patients, they want development of a female hairline, at least my male to female, they want a feminine hairline and filling in of their temples. And that is easy to accomplish, but the density that they want is not so easy to accomplish on one procedure. So often, you know, you can only get so many hairs packed into a given region on one procedure without causing damage to the scalp. So. I educate trans and female patients who want a more advanced hairline that they're probably going to need two if they want really good density because one, it will certainly give a great improvement, but sometimes people want more. Yeah, no, that's, that's true. Yeah, and I also tell people I basically respect the hairs that are currently there but mm -hmm. they may not be there in the future. So then you're like leaving, you know, empty spaces that then later on need to be filled in again. So yeah. So you speaking of, you know, lowering the hairline with, with grafting. I'm just curious, what are your thoughts on surgical hairline lowering? Surgical hairline lowering, I find to be quite risky. I, I find that a lot of patients who come to me who've had that done are coming because they notice that little line at the very frontal most aspect. When you do a hairline lowering procedure, there's going to be that little line scar at the front and sometimes it's quite visible and then they just need a transplant, a, a hair transplant in front of it to disguise that line scar. So generally I discourage people from doing any kind of hairline lowering procedure just because of that, you know, pretty much guaranteed line at the front of their head. And then they're going to want a hair transplant to hide that line scar. Yeah, I mean, I found that I, about, I would say 50 to 70% of the time, you can hide that, you know, linear of a scar with um, properly designing the incision. So the way you bevel, you know, your knife when you're cutting can allow the hairs to kind of grow through the scar. 
but it doesn't always work out. And the other thing is that the, the temples usually aren't brought down enough in, you know, female. Most of the cases are, are women. So yeah, the discussions always had about doing like a, basically like a, a touch up FUE, you know, after yeah. three to four months after surgery. But yeah, no, it's, uh, it's good to get different perspectives I on it. I think also, you know, I, I'm getting a self-selected group of people mm -hmm. who are coming to me having had those procedures and having a line scar at the front. You know, I'm not seeing the ones that are done very well because they're not coming to me requesting that line be hidden at the front of their head. So that's true. Um, I'm definitely self-selecting. Yeah, that's true. But I think surgeons who are doing a surgical hairline lowering procedures need to talk to their patients about the real possibility of doing, you know, additional hair restoration work after the mm -hmm. surgery. So it's not like a one-time thing, just like, mm -hmm. you know, we were talking about sometimes an FUE or an FUT procedure not being one time and that's it, everything's done for life with this type of surgical hairline advancement, uh, in my opinion. Are, are you doing FUT as well for um, hair transplantation or? I do, but not often at all. I mean, it's just, I, you know, most of my training was with FUE, you know, I'm a head and neck surgeon. So the, the process of doing FUT is very straightforward for me. I just find that for most people, I mean, other than like, I guess if so, so people who I feel like would really benefit from it, if you really need to do like a mega case, I agree, you can get more grafts with FUT. But most of the patients that I'm seeing don't want like full head coverage and they're completely bald. I mean, I just don't have that many patients like that where you need like really high numbers, like over 3000 grafts and things like that. So I find that most of the time I can get away with, with FUE and I find the recovery is easier and it's just I'm more comfortable with the process of it. And I don't need as many technicians or you know help basically right. which i like you know i don't have in the space that i'm in i just don't have like you know five rooms and people can be cutting all yeah. over the place so <laughs> Takes a I just need to, yeah yeah exactly i can keep it a little bit kind of tighter on the kind of overall number of people helping and yeah just people kind of want it more these days so i think if i had like say an, an older patient who really couldn't um, lay prone for, you know, many hours at a time, I'd consider just doing the strip and kind of getting it out and then harvesting off that. And uh, potentially if you need to do a really big case and you don't want to stretch it out over days of operating on one person, mm -hmm. then that's another good reason. But otherwise, uh, I'm just quite comfortable with the FUE and it's pretty low, like a small kind of footprint because the Trevellini is like this big. So, you right. know, I, I don't have like a, a robot room or anything like that. It's, um, but again, I think it, it, if you trust the surgeon, you trust the results that they can generate for you. And if mm -hmm. they're super involved, like I don't book anything else on those days. I know some people bounce around different rooms, different mm -hmm. procedures. When I'm doing a transplant, I'm kind of all in and I'm there the whole time. That's what you need to do if you're not as big of a practice as you guys are where you're doing as many cases all the time. You need to be all in and need to know what you're doing. And that's the only other way to get kind of consistent results. Otherwise, like you said, like, you, you know, you're coming into like a Bosley, even though I don't really know much about Bosley, but, <laughs> but you know, it's like kind of a more cookie cutter type yeah. of um, enterprise. And you just don't know who you're getting that day, like what, you know, what mood they're in, what, you know, what kind of yeah. uh, help there is. And so, so I always recommend that people, you know, if they want a second opinion, go to like another sort of trusted, more like boutique practice with the proper sort of knowledge and skill set in this area. It's the only way to, you know, to get good results consistently. Right. So, yeah, and then I do body hair, you know, because I don't do like arms and legs, it's too thin. So you need to do like thousands and thousands of graphs to get any kind of density. Mm -hmm. But usually, especially for men, and that's usually the only type you know, only gender kind of getting body hair for the most part. Neck, so beard, but like lower beard on the, along the neck mm -hmm. is the next place I go if, if yeah. the scalp is exhausted. And then chest or like up, upper abdomen and then maybe back. But those are, you know, it's kind of where I stop. And uh, yeah, so that's one type of reason, I guess, that people sort of find me. But all those areas, you know, that they, they carry their own potential risks and problems. And, mm -hmm. you know, you just have to be honest with people. And, and it's never as reliable as scalp to scalp. Right. It just, it just isn't. So, yeah. you know, scalp micropigmentation, just wanted to hear your thoughts. Like, do you do it? Do you think it's helpful? Yeah. What are the best indications? Yeah, I started the scalp micropigmentation at at my office. We do it there still. I no longer am personally doing it, but I have a technician who is mm -hmm. better. She does it now. Mm -hmm. But certainly it's a, it's a totally different option than a hair transplant. 
you know, scalp mm -hmm. micropigmentation, you know, for people who don't know is, is a topical tattoo that mm -hmm. is permanent or semi-permanent and it provides the illusion of hair there and it helps decrease the contrast between, you know, a thinning region and the surrounding scalp. So it's just designed to provide an illusion of hair, much like a, t a topic or some kind of topical concealer would, but it does not put the physical hair there and it's a very different appearance. You know, a lot of people like it for a shaved head look. I personally am not very much into the shaved head look with scalp micropigmentation. I don't I, like it either. Yeah. <laughs> I mostly use it for a couple of reasons. You know, women with thinning parts who just want a little filling in because, you know, they have dark hair and a light scalp and they just want a little bit more of an illusion. I think it works very well in women with kind of a mild diffuse thinning where the, the hair can supplement the tattoo to give an illusion of fullness. And then I also use it in my FUT patients who have a line scar back there that's, you know, a little bit bright or a little stretched and, you know, just a little too visible and they want to disguise it. You can also, you know, SMP along the tiny dots of FUE right. and give, give more yeah. fullness too. So, you know, those are my favorite usages of it. I'm not a huge fan of the shaved, total shaved head look. I think it's really tricky to, to do and to do it right. And there's a lot of concerns about um, discoloration of dyes and yeah. long-term outcomes. So I generally shy away from it. Yeah, I also like for someone who's had say three or four transplants and they just kind of have had enough, enough or they've just yeah. they've exhausted their supply. So right. just kind of add that sort of density look, you know, where they're yeah. not using topic all the time, but they have something little else. So I'll occasionally do that where, you know, we can go throughout the scalp without getting kind of too close to the hairline. But I agree, I, I don't, I've never done like a full kind of like shaved head thing. I, I don't think that those individuals who want that look may you know kind of come to people like us you know there are a lot of sort of specialized places for smp where they're doing that all the time and those right. are the pictures that they're putting out there so yeah. people who like that i guess find those individuals as my guess yeah i generally will refer to some other you know pretty well-known smp artists in new york city if they're yeah. looking for that shaved head look it takes a special center to be able to achieve that and it's just not our specialty you know we like to do it for the other you know usages that i mentioned so yeah no I, I agree with that too what about the ink that's used for smp because i've done my research into this and it is all over the map with like what yeah. kind of ink is you see some people are like oh i use only organic ink and all this crap and then you know you have plenty of of true smp sort of artists if you will who have like sort of dispelled the myth that there's some special ink that doesn't change color, doesn't do this. So I guess question one is like, do you guys have a specific ink that you use? And I mean, what are your thoughts on this whole ink business? Yeah, so we've changed our inks a couple times. It's really a mystery question in the SMP world, in my opinion. At first, we used to use a very well-known doctor's proprietary ink line, which yeah. they didn't, they don't release the ingredients in, which I found, <laughs> I, I found very, very, you know, suspicious. And, you know, I just couldn't really justify using those inks, even though they were, you know, used for many, many years and, and whatnot. I just, not knowing the ingredients really bothered me. So then we started yeah. switching to using basically a black ink that gets yeah. diluted out and it doesn't discolor over time. It just fades and gets reabsorbed by the body if it's not kept up. So the inks and SMP are just a hotly debated topic. And, you know, I, I find that even other countries who have done SMP for longer. There's some specialists in Mexico that do a variety of colored inks, you know, and they'll do shades of brown and blonde and red and all these yeah. things. And it's really complex field in terms of the ink choice, so. Yeah, I think it, it, it sometimes has the illusion of being complex when it's really actually quite like basic. Yeah, it's just that, shades of black. <laughs> after reading all about it, I was like, wait, like, people are just using black ink and just putting their name on it. Yeah. It reminds me of like the skincare lines and everyone's like, uh, this is the Yeah, Dr. So-and-so skincare line. It's like, well, it's just, it's just a, you know, at least in the hair industry, I always see people with just a version of a different version of minoxidil and they'll make it, you know, 5.5% right. yeah, or 7%, yeah, yeah. Exactly. you know, or, you know, everybody's selling their own retinoids under their own dermatology practice. And it's yeah. like, well, it's just the same exact thing. It's off by a fraction of a percent. And then there's, an extra scent added to it to make it proprietary. 
and it's people very just, gimmicky they, and, and, yeah. and quite frankly misleading and, and confusing for patients so I, I just i hate that stuff and it also i think maybe allows people to charge more by yes. saying like oh my ink it, it comes from you know i don't know south africa from like a special plant I mean, go, right go. one thing i have to credit you know my partner bob bernstein is that we don't we don't make any of our own products that we're selling in our our reception area we're not advertising behind glass cases any fancy things so you know it's just pure science in our office our website is really based on educating our patients and we find it copied all over the world we really are down to the the nitty-gritty we want real data behind what we're offering in our office and we're not out there to you know sell a quick 20 buck product to somebody just because it's got the bernstein medical name on there or anything we want real results we want happy patients we want to live with ourselves and follow science which is how we were trained in medical school so right yeah you don't have to be gimmicky to be successful i don't it's not worth it <laughs> agree and then in terms of the future of hair transplants um christine what do you think are you know the some of the most exciting developments out there yeah so you know this summer, you know, I'm probably going to be starting up some follicle banking with a company in England, which will be nice for people who want to preserve their existing follicles at the back of their scalp from a young age when they're, you know, at optimal condition. The whole point of that is really for future hair cloning options, which, you know, are, are not around the corner whatsoever in the U.S., but, you know, in, in maybe 10 years, we may have the option to give somebody who has only a few hairs at the back of their scalp, you know, they could potentially get a full head of hair, which is incredibly exciting, but some people want to preserve their hairs now and freeze them on ice, just like you know, women freeze their eggs and stuff. So hair cloning is starting up in uh, Asia. You know, early studies are starting in Asia with mm -hmm. hair cloning. It's going to take quite a few years for those to be complete and deemed safe. And then beyond that, it's going to have to be done in the United States and approved by the FDA for surgical device use. So it's going to be quite a ways off. But I think hair cloning is, is the future in hair restoration surgery. And mm -hmm. it's going to be super exciting. It's certainly going to be in my generation of working and uh, it's Let's definitely, hope. you know, I'm gonna keep on working till I can do some hair cloning because I think the, the prospects are really exciting and you know, it's nice not to feel limited by graph numbers at the back and sides of somebody's scalp and say, okay, sorry, you only have 4,000 graphs or 5,000 yeah. graphs for a lifetime worth of surgery. You know, to give somebody that full head of hair and not have to worry about running out of graphs would be just amazing, you know? So yeah, no, I, I all this will be a way of the past at that point. So let's let's hope. I yeah. saw that you spent time at MIT, right, for your undergrad. My undergrad, yeah. D do you know um, Bob Langer, or did you know? Yeah, the Langer Lab. Okay. Yeah, Langer Lab. So yeah, so he, yeah, I mean, I'm just reading his book and just, yeah, you know, I mean, I never, I actually, I met him once, but like, I never worked in his lab or anything. But yeah. I worked at kind of one of his mentees' labs. She went to Columbia, and when I was there. For med school, I spent um, some time in her lab doing tissue engineering, and that was like an amazing experience. But what I've been reading when it comes to the cloning is that those two worlds almost need to collide for something really great to happen. So it's not just about, you know, kind of coaxing cells to become hair or whatever, that kind of ability to recreate that three dimensional structure. And Absolutely. then hopefully we can, you know, I guess implant them for people. But I'm not quite sure that we're there with the tissue engineering aspect of it. Um, right. So it'll be interesting to see how all that, you know, kind of fuses. Over yeah, time. you know, a, a really inspiring person who's working on some fantastic research is Angela Cristiano yeah. up at Columbia. And, you know, they've really figured out that they can do these 3D wells of right. sim that can, you know, simulate uh, a cluster of dermal papilla cells in, in a bulb and then, you know, actually propagate a hair follicle. I think it was in like 20 or 21 days they could actually recreate the hair follicle, but it had to be a little drop of a bulb of papilla cells in order to give you that 3D structure to actually formulate the new follicle. So yeah, there's yeah, a lot yeah. of really cool research coming up, but I agree there's so much to be learned and there needs to be more of a crossover between the researchers and the clinicians. Yeah, no, and, and you know, she has alopecia areata, which I have as well. 
So um, that's a whole other, I'm not gonna, I, I share my story on my Instagram all the time, but not to bore people again. But, but yeah, so she's obviously done a lot of interesting work with like jack inhibitors and all that. And yes. uh, I decided, especially with the COVID situation to not go on those, but I'm actually doing squaric acid treatments, which I mean, I, I guess as a derm, you probably know what yep. that is. But yeah, so I don't know, we just found the dose that seems to work. So Yeah, it's tough we'll medicine see. to tolerate. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. It definitely feels a little, little itchy and annoying. Someone asked us a question about, is there any institution offering hair transplant training courses, workshops? I mean, I know my former mentor, Dr. Jeff Epstein, has a course out there in Miami. I mean, I know Sam Lamb has a course yeah, in so St. Louis. There, uh, there's definitely like a St. Louis course uh, for physicians that people can take. Information about that's available on the ISHRS website. Beyond that, you know, there are formal fellowships in hair transplant that, that doctors can take. There's only a few that are actually board approved fellowships, but they're a one year apprenticeship under you know, a hair transplant surgeon. Beyond that, you know, sometimes it comes down to, you know, you finish your residency program and you actually just apprentice under somebody who is already, you know, very astute at hair transplant. And you, you kind of only as good as your mentors. Like I was really lucky. I uh, trained under Bill Rassman and Bob Bernstein, which are the creators of follicular unit transplantation as we know it. So I've got the fathers of hair transplant helping me out. So they were great mentors and I can never thank them enough for all the training that they provided me when I first started out. Yeah, I mean, I think a weekend course, unfortunately, is not enough to do high level work. There's a lot of nuances just with any, like any other type of procedural, you know, activity. It takes many, like seeing many different scenarios of something to really get comfortable with it. And then again, finding a situation where you can keep that flow of patients to keep your hands, you know, fresh. So it's all very important. So it's, um, yeah, so it's it's, yeah, uh, of course, is one thing, but like you said, kind of really diving in with with a great mentor is um, a whole different experience. Right, and it, it really comes down to training, you know, really diligently. I mean, it takes, yeah. you know, hundreds and hundreds of transplants later, do you really start to feel like you're getting really good at it? Um, yeah. And you know, some offices where hair transplant is an offering, but you're really only doing one a, one a month or one every couple months. You, it's going to take you a century to to get you know, the number of cases under your belt that you really need to be, you know, an expert. So it's tough. If you're not seeing that much volume, it's going to take forever to get trained. It's certainly not a weekend type of thing or a month long type of thing. And to know both skills is really important, FUT and FUE, because not all patients are a good FUE patient. Not all patients are good FUT. I always recommend people go to offices that offer both. Otherwise, your hair transplant, you know, surgeon's going to just point you toward the one that they offer, unfortunately. So... Um, you you got to get, you know, comfortable with your surgeon, make sure they seem like they know what they're doing. They've done a thousand cases, you know, then you really feel like they know uh, how to help you. Yeah, yeah, totally. Good. And then how do patients find you, Christine, to, to chat more, do a consultation? Yeah, so I mean, I do have my personal Instagram, Christine Shaver, MD. Bernstein Medical also has an Instagram our website, you know, I can't speak enough about BernsteinMedical.com. Really great resource for patients. If you contact our email, our office email, contact at Bernstein Medical, I actually go through that Monday through Friday every day, answering hundreds of patient questions. You can easily get a hold of me and you can book a consultation through our website or just by calling the office. So I do yeah, consults yeah. for men and women and we do surgery every day. So always happy to take on new patients. Awesome, well, great. This was really, I think, very educational for people. I'll be reposting the video, so it's not gonna just disappear. Disappear, off the yeah. Hours. Yeah, but great. Anything else you want to add? No, I think that's good. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, I mean, thanks for seeing. Stay yeah, safe in this uh, interesting time of uh, the world. Yeah, yeah, you too, and hopefully we'll meet in person soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, once everything reopens, we'll meet up. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. Be well, okay. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. See you. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.